This conference is brought to you by Callstack, your React and React Native development experts. Thank you, everybody. Do you know that there is an AI that you can use right now to generate the equivalent of hundreds or thousands of lines of application code? The only prompt you have to give to this AI is requirements. The AI itself will devise algorithms and procedures to implement those requirements for you. It'll run in mere microseconds. It doesn't use much memory. It doesn't use much CPU. It's guaranteed to give you code that will exactly implement the requirements you provided. You might have heard of this AI before. It's called Structured Query Language, or SQL. Now, some of y'all are laughing because you think, oh, no, an AI is speaking a human language to me. And if you'd only listened to AI within the past few years, you might believe that because every time Lately, people have been using the word AI. They mean it as a synonym for a large language model. But AI is actually a much broader definition than that. AI, an, an, an artificial intelligence, is any machine or program that will accomplish tasks that would normally be the domain of an intelligent being. So let's think about that for a moment. Y'all are all intelligent beings. What do you do all day? Your boss, your customers, your clients come to you and they present, with you, present you with requirements, right? And then you devise algorithms and implement code that fulfill those requirements. That's what you do. That's what SQL does for you. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing maybe a little bit of feedback here, a little bit of, 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 of disbelief amongst you. Let me, let me try and, and, and sell this point. Let me explain what's going on. To set a foundation, let's think a little bit about how programming languages work. You're familiar with how C++ works, right? You, you've got some source code. It goes through a compiler, which translates that source code into um, uh, machine code, which then is interpreted by hardware to produce the result. And, uh, Rust works the same way, and Go works the same way, and JavaScript, it's, it's similar. It doesn't necessarily go to machine code, and, and unless you've got a JIT, but it, it will uh, normally go to like bytecode or some other structure, but it's, the point is it translates it into something that the machine can more readily understand. And Java works that way. It goes to bytecode. And Python works that way, and so does Ruby, and you know, whatever your favorite programming language is, the point is you have a compiler that translates your human-friendly source code into a, a, a form that is more friendly to the machine where it's going to be executed. So a key insight is that SQL is just another programming language. Every statement of SQL is a program. And there's a compiler in every implementation of SQL that translates that program into what we call a prepared statement. It's just an executable form. Now, in the particular version of, or the particular implementation of SQL that I wrote, called SQLite, uh, the uh, prepared statement is in the form of bytecode. And if you're interested, you can you put the explain keyword before an SQL statement, and instead of running the bytecode, it disassembles it and prints it out for you. We use this for testing and debugging. You might use it just to amuse yourself and to see exactly what the compiler is doing behind the scenes. But the key difference here between all these other programming languages and SQL is that all those other programming languages, they're just translating an algorithm. You have to specify in your source code the complete algorithm, the step-by-step -step process that will, it will undergo in order to compute your result. That's not the way SQL works. With SQL, you just hand it requirements, and the, the, the SQL compiler generates its own algorithms and the code for that. It's a generative AI. All right, maybe you're like me. Maybe 
maybe the only SQL you've seen a pretty simple statement. I know when I first encountered SQL, I, I only saw statements like the ones that are on screen. Very simple statements involving one table, and if there was a constraint, it was against a primary key. So there's only one row and one table. And I, when I first looked at this, when I was first introduced to SQL, I looked at this and I thought, really? This, you know, this looks a lot like COBOL. Do, 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 do we re is this really necessary? Do we really need to complicate these matters with you know, this weird SQL syntax? Why can't I just write uh, application code in the language of my choosing that calls a key value store directly? Why do I need this SQL thing? And, and that's a reasonable thing if, if your SQL is simple statements like that. In fact, in the, in the implementation of SQL that I do, um, if it sees a really simple statement like this, it bypasses the AI altogether and just, just, just runs it for you. The AI only comes into play when you get into more interesting statements like this that have multiple sources of data, uh, subqueries, uh, recursive common table expressions, uh, lots of different inputs. These sorts of things, the algorithm to compute them is not simple. And you can benefit from an AI to do it for you. So let's work through a simple example of this. So I've got a simple schema here. We've got nodes and edges. Uh, the nodes have names. They don't have to be unique. And the edges have attributes. They also, the edges are associated with an, a, a node on both ends. And, and there's a lot of different real world applications for this kind of thing. I'm going to keep it real abstract. Um, here's our query. We're going to ask for all of the edges that go between nodes named AAA and nodes named BBB and have attribute one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's our query. Now, suppose you were going to try and implement this. What algorithm do you choose to do this? There's, there's, well, well, before I get to that, let me first point out that there's no algorithm specified in your prompt. All you've done is specify the requirements. You've got data sources and constraints. No procedures. What algorithm you can, will you choose? There's actually a number of different algorithms that you could do to use to compute this. I'm only going to show you two here today, but it's these two illustrate an important point. In algorithm one, it's going through and it's finding all the nodes named AAA and BBB, and then for each one of those, it looks to see, it, it filters out the ones that, that, that have um, an attribute uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, or that, that have an edge between them with attribute 1, 2, 3, 4 and outputs those. Algor algorithm 2 starts with the edges and it looks for edges that ha have the attribute 1, 2, 3, 4 and then it checks both endpoints to see if they have uh, uh, the name AAA or BBB. Which algorithm do you choose? Which would be the best choice? Well, that depends. Depends on your data. I mean, if your data has very few nodes but a lot of edges, then algorithm one will work faster. If your data contains a, only a few nodes but a lot of edges, then algorithm two will work faster. So which one do you choose? Which one do you code? Maybe, um, maybe you write code for them both and they're inside an if then else. But then what's your decision criteria for, for your branch? How do you determine the right Threshold. How do you test this? How long does it take you to write this? There's a lot of decisions being made by that AI that you don't have to do. Can you, can you decide how to do this in about 10 microseconds? That's what the AI is doing for you. Let's look at a slightly more complex example. This is an actual um, benchmark example from the Transaction Processing Performance Council. Uh, it's a standard benchmark and uh, developers of SQL database engines use this to evaluate the performance of their AIs. Uh, it's a complex query. There's, a nest, uh, there's an outer query that uh, does an aggregation and then an inner query that's gathering data. Let's just think about that inner query for right now. It's got some data sources, eight different data sources, and a whole bunch of constraints. And so it's not at all obvious what is the algorithm you're going to do use to compute the answer to this. Uh, the one way that you can do this is that you can uh, create a graph with one node for each input. And then you go back and you populate edges on that graph with these weights. Now the, the process by which you come up with these edges and weights 
is a long story. That's about an eight-hour tutorial. I don't really have time for that right now. Let's just take that as a given at the moment. And it's a fascinating story. It's just, it's not difficult, but it does take time to explain. But the, but the idea here is we can find a really good algorithm if we can find a path through this graph that visits each node exactly one time and that minimizes the sum of the weights. Now, this is similar to the traveling salesman problem that you might have heard of, which is NP-complete. And this, this is NP-complete as well. So you're going to have to use a heuristic to compute this. Well, actually, we could, we could do an exhaustive search with only eight nodes. But if you got into like 12 or 15 or 20 nodes, it becomes intractable. It's just too difficult to compute. You've got to use a heuristic in order to do this. And so the, a common heuristic for something like this is what's called the nearest neighbor rule. You pick as your next step the arc with the lowest value. So what is the first arc we're going to pick? It's going to be the wild card going down to node R. And the next step is that arc over to node N1. Can you see what the next step is going to be? Any guesses? It's going to be the wild card to node N2. And then the next step is to S and L. It's always picking the lowest cost step to go to the next, uh, next node. And so the total cost for this is 36.92. You can check my math later. The question is, is this the best route? Did, the, did our nearest neighbor heuristic give us the best solution? Not in this case. And I, think, I suspect that the Transaction Processing Performance Council included this case because it doesn't give you the best result here. Because if you start with the P node, even though that's an expensive arc, and then you also go up to the L node, which is another expensive arc, once you get there, then you can follow these very inexpensive arcs and complete the graph, and the total cost is only 26.39, or 38, 27.38. And you say, 27.38, 36.92, is that, that really big, a diff, that big of a difference? These are logarithmic numbers. This new algorithm is 750 times faster than the previous one. That's the difference in getting your answer in a couple seconds versus getting your answer in about an hour. And the point of this is not so much to say that, you know, you need to understand what's happening behind the scenes in order to use SQL. The point is that the SQL compiler, the AI that's in there, it needs to use a lot of advanced techniques, a lot of inference, in order to solve an NP-complete problem in a reasonable amount of time, or find a good approximation to the NP-complete problem in a reasonable amount of time. There's a lot going on behind the scenes, working on your behalf so that you don't have to. We all have a limited number of brain cycles. We can only do so much in a day. Wouldn't it be better to, to hand off some of the, our responsibilities, like? figuring this stuff out to an AI that's built into our tools so that we can focus on solving real problems for our customers. In this particular example, we've only solved the part in blue. We still have to worry about um, uh, the aggregation in the red. Uh, I haven't talked about uh, outer joins. I haven't talked about recursive common table expressions. I haven't talked about views. There can be a lot of complication. My point is merely this. SQL is an AI. It's an AI assistant that you can use to dramatically improve your productivity. Think of it that way. You hear so much about AIs these days, but are you, are you really, don't you understand that we've had this AI capability, these AI assistant capabilities for decades now, and they just work. They just work. All right, um, real quick, some, some, some takeaways from this. What can you do to avoid being play, replaced by an AI? Everywhere I look, there's new articles about everybody's going to lose their job and be replaced by an AI. Is that true? I don't think so. Look, there's a formula that you can use that will guarantee that you will always be gainfully employed. This formula is universal. It has worked throughout time. It works across all cultures and civilizations. You'll think it is silly when I show it to you but you've probably never thought of it. It's worth putting into words. The way you keep your job is that you solve more problems than you create. Think of it as a formula. The number of problems you create needs to be less than the number of problems you solve. We all create problems in our job because we expect to be paid. And our customers, our bosses, they don't want to pay us. They don't want to just give us money. So we have to... Uh, we have to create problems at least proportional to what we're getting paid. I mean, we have to solve problems at least proportional to what we're being paid. 
you know, a good, good way of keeping this, this, uh, this equation in balance is to not create unnecessary problems. Being paid is necessary, but don't create unnecessary problems. Be easy to work with. Be friendly. Be nice to your coworkers and customers. Love your neighbor. Look, go out, get a Bible, turn to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Grok it. It will change your life for the better. I know this from personal experience. I've observed it in many other people. Okay, that explains how you minimize the number of problems you create. How do you re improve the number of problems you solve? Well, one way to do that is to make use of these AI tools like SQL. Become fluent at SQL, and then you can dramatically improve your productivity, solve more problems faster and with greater accuracy. I'm not saying that you know, if you, you're fluent at SQL, it will absolutely guarantee you will never lose your job, but it will help. Okay, can you use a large language model, AI, in order to write SQL for you? Well, yeah, you can actually, and there's companies that sell this, but, but the current state of the art in this is such that if you get SQL out of a large language model, you really want to code review this very carefully because large language models, the current state of the art is if they get confused, they hallucinate. They just give you answers that seem authoritative but are nonsense. So, you know, in my opinion, it's really easier just to write the SQL yourself, become proficient in it, you've solved the previous question, and then also you don't have to worry about using a large language model to write your SQL for you. Okay, so you're going to use SQL. Do you want to use a client server SQL database engine like MySQL or Postgres, or do you want to use an embedded database engine like SQLite? That depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I have a checklist here to help you with this decision. If your data is on a different computer, if you have to go across the network to get your data, you probably want to use a client server database like MySQL or Postgres. If your data is big, and by big I mean bigger than you're willing to put into a single file on disk, more than a few terabytes, use a client server database. Or do you have lots of concurrent writes going on? Uh, use a client server database. But for most of the problems you have don't meet these requirements, and you can go with SQLite. It works great. Where people mess this up is that they see that they don't need those first three points, and so they say, well, I don't need a database at all. I'll just store this. I'll, I'll open files on disk and store it there. Or I'll use a key value store. No. If you do that, you're, you're, you're giving up your AI assistant. Make use of the AI. One final question, um, and this last question, you need to answer for yourself. I, I, I can't answer this for you. You know now that SQL uh, can dramatically improve your productivity. It can improve your accuracy. Uh, it can solve problems for you. It can do all these things. Why aren't you using it more? My name is Richard. Find me here at the conference and give me your answer in person. Thank you for your attention.